Make at least that much noise, twice as much noise for Matthew Dix as he comes up to the stage. Matthew Dix. Thank you. <laughs> it was bad when I threw my shoe at my third grade student and hit her in the head. <laughs> and it was the first day of school, which is the only day of the entire school year when kids want to go home and tell their parents what happened in school that day. <laughs> and the principal's daughter was in my classroom that year. So there was no way he wasn't going to find out what happened. So I sat at my desk and I prepared a vigorous defense. I was going to explain to him that I did not mean to hit her in the head with my shoe. I meant to throw it high for effect. And it was only because she couldn't stay in her seat, which was the reason I threw the shoe in the first place, <laughs> that she was hit. So really, it was a natural consequence. It was not my fault. I was also going to point out that I was wearing a loafer that day, which, while technically a shoe, on the periodic table of footwear, is much more closely aligned to a slipper. So I didn't really do any damage in hitting her. And so with my defense ready, I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and he never came to talk to me. So after a week, I went to the kid who I hit, and I said, you didn't tell your parents that I hit you with a shoe? And she said, no, and I said, why? And she said, because they would have found out I was misbehaving, and I don't need that kind of trouble. <laughs> and, and then I went to the principal's daughter, and I said, you didn't tell your father that I hit Roxy with a shoe? And she said, I don't tell my father anything. <laughs> and at that moment, I knew I was going to have a great school year, because these kids came into my room with my personal belief system fully intact <laughs> within them. And by November, like, I had made meaningful connections with every kid in that class except one. And her name was Lisa. Lisa was a short girl with the most Coke bottle-ish Coke bottle glasses you've ever seen. She had long black hair that she pulled down over her eyes like a curtain. Lisa was shy. Lisa was almost invisible if you didn't look closely. And by November, I had run out of tricks to try to get Lisa out of her shell and to talk. And I'd resign myself to the fact that this is a quiet kid who's going to pass through my classroom quietly. And then one Friday, I was collecting homework, going from desk to desk to pick it up, and the kids were giving me a hard time. They were telling me how stupid the assignment had been and what a waste of time it was, and I got frustrated, and I finally shouted out, bring out your dad, bring out your dad. I'm standing next to Lisa's desk, and she looks up and says, Monty Python and the Holy Grail? <laughs> and I say, yes! You know Monty Python and the Holy Grail? And she parts her little curtain a little bit, <laughs> and she says, bring me a shrubbery. <laughs> this little eight-year-old girl knew Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It made sense that I knew it from like 18 to 22. I'd watched the movie like a thousand times. But this little girl knew the movie, and even better, her comedic timing was perfect. We started bantering back and forth. She'd throw out a line, I'd throw out a line. She'd say like, I fart in your general direction. <laughs> and she started talking for the first time. And then the kids started asking like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> and I said, it's Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It's the greatest movie of all time, but it's totally inappropriate, so you should not see it. <laughs> And so she continued. There was a moment when a kid came in from recess with a cut on his finger, and I, didn't, I don't let kids go to the nurse ever unless they're already dead, so he was, like, going back and forth with me. And she walked by, she paused, she looked at it and said, "'Tis but a flesh wound," and just walked on. And I'm like, she's a genius. And then this amazing thing happens. Four boys go home for the weekend, have a sleepover, and somehow they get their parents to rent the Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And they come in on Monday, and they can quote a little bit of the movie, but more importantly, they understand that Lisa is funny. And she starts talking more. And then one by one by one, every kid in my class finds a way to see Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And every time they come back into the classroom, we cheer them, and Lisa gains stature every time. 
And she starts writing. She starts writing jokes which are really terrible and not funny. But third graders are so stupid and they think they're funny. And she's perceived as a funny person. And then the principal comes into my room and now he's mad. He says to me, my daughter tells me she's the only one in your class who hasn't seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail. What is going on? And I said, I had nothing to do with it. It's an inappropriate movie and I do not encourage it. Sounds like you have a problem. And eventually even she sees the movie. And then March comes and Lisa's parents come in for a parent-teacher conference. They sit across my desk and they tell me that Lisa's entire life has changed. That she goes home and she loves school and she can't wait to get back for the first time in her life. They tell me that I'm the best teacher. The guy who hit a girl in the head with a shoe <laughs> is the best teacher ever. And I believe it for two days. <laughs> and then I'm walking down the hall and I pass Stephanie, a fifth grader who I had in third grade. Stephanie was like Lisa, she did not talk. Her friend Kiana used to talk for her, she was so quiet. I passed Stephanie and I realized right away, I never found her Monty Python and the Holy Grail because I gave up on her. And then I remember Joseph from eight years ago, my first class. I can't remember the sound of Joseph's voice because I don't know if he ever even spoke that year. And I think about how I didn't find his Monty Python and the Holy Grail either. I think about Lisa and I don't think of a success anymore. I did not save Lisa. If anything, Monty Python did, but really, it was dumb luck. I got aggravated in class and shouted out a line from a movie and I connected with a kid. But for eight years, all of those quiet kids in my class, I gave up on. So when I think about Lisa today, my mind jumps right to Stephanie and Joseph and all those other quiet kids who I let down, who I gave up on. And so she serves for me not as success, but as a reminder that I can never ever let that happen again. Thanks. Matthew Dix.